for a set uh, set pattern <laughs> to present his uh, latest and greatest electron integration with SBTC. So, yeah, uh, is it recording yet? Yeah, it is, Hero. Cool. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to SIP call number 50. Oh, my God, we are like almost like halfway to 100. It's amazing. Um, yes, today is end of each month. We have a steering committee update uh, the last Friday of the month. Um, so, yeah, so we will give you an overview. I think the key focus are on what's being ratified and give you a bit of update about what else is in development and the key stuff, key highlights. So, yeah. Um, well, let's do this. Yeah, cool. So just for those um, who might be here the first time, um, we do have three steering committee members, um, Jude, Marvin, and Gina. Um, and Marvin is a chief, chief developer at Writer. Jude is a stack core engineer at the foundation. And Gina is a chief of staff at Trust Machines. So um, the idea is, is having various people around this, um, the ecosystem coming together, um, sort of be the steward of the, um, the blockchain. Um, so they are not there to propose what to approve, but um, they are there to oversee if any everybody's sort of moving the SIPs along and you know whether the SIPs are um, in accordance to what the community wishes. Um, so yeah, they act as a final approver in the process. So just to give you an overview of the process, um, the SIP goes from idea, from draft, to being reviewed by SIP editor, and then they turn that into accepted. And then the, the CAP, the Consideration Advisory Board, then would review that and turn that into recommended. And then the final panel who review the, the SIP itself would be by the steering committee. So they basically sort of give the final thumbs up, uh, making sure everything is, is done right. Then it will be in activation in progress. Sometimes it just goes from there being to ratified as long as all the criteria are met. Some of the criteria require public voting. Therefore, we have one more step of community approval, uh, such as Stacks 2.1. We needed everybody to vote. So some step we need public voting, some step we don't. So that's the sort of um, the approval process for the SIPs. So these three groups of people are really key in the SIP process. The SIP editors first, and then the CAPS, and then the steering committee. Um, yeah, so if you have any SIP idea, uh, you can propose on Stacks Forum, and then we'll come together on Twitter or Discord, or um, we have bi-weekly editors to the space. We have the weekly SIP calls. All these avenues are for you to advocate for your ideas. And and then things once things are shaped a little bit more, we can move to GitHub. And then if you think it's um, you want to submit a PR, a pull request, uh, if it's more shaped and more final, then you can do that. And then you'll get reviewed by the SIP editors, the, the boards, and then the, com the steering committees and voting if need be. Uh, so that's sort of the overall SIP process. So any technical SIP or governance related SIPs will be reviewed according to that process. Um, so yeah, so just to give everybody a quick overview of what's happened in June. Um, so we have these monthly review is that uh, the biggest thing, SIP 19 has been ratified on GitHub. So if you go to the SIP repo itself, you will see um, the SIP 19 listed along with all the other, other ratified ones, such as uh, Stack 2.1, i.e. SIP 15. Um, and I've asked uh, if uh, J2P2 can give a very quick overview of what is SIP-19. Uh, J2P2, would you like to share with everybody? Hi, everyone. Sure. Let me share my slides.
Can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay. So SIP 19, it's basically um, uh, notifications for token metadata updates. Um, so it is now a standard to solve the problem of outdated metadata information in Stacks network. Um, so we'll cover why this problem happens, solution in the, uh, some details about it and uh, why it's important. So the main problem, uh, tokens, for example, any fungible token or NFT or semi-fungible um, tokens, they have some information associated with them um, and we call that metadata. Now this metadata can change over time uh, due to various reasons, like if art, artwork associated with the token changes, or if the storage uh, where those artworks are stored, if that storage matters to some other source storage provider and so on. So without a standard way to share these changes, um, any apps on networks that uses that metadata to display to users uh, will cause confusion if they are outdated. So this is the problem that this SIP addressed. The solution, um, it proposes a way for developers to tell the stacks network when the token metadata has changed. And this allows everyone to update their information and display the most current data. So how does it work? Um, when a contract needs to tell the network that metadata has changed, it will use a clarity function called print. Uh, when this print function gets executed, uh, there is an event that gets attached to the transaction and that uh, same event gets shared to uh, shared in the is included in the block and, um, and these events basically act as a notification for apps and they can update their or refresh their metadata there are basically um, the it also introduces some uh, different update modes so it's very flexible uh, implementation um, there are three modes uh, in standard mode uh, metadata is valid until next update. In frozen mode, uh, metadata will never change. So uh, indexers will know that it won't change. And in dynamic mode, um, we tell indexers that metadata will change quickly. And there is a time to leave field associated in case of a dynamic mode to let indexers know when or how often the metadata will be refreshed. So it's pretty flexible implementation. And why this CP is important? Because um, it gives accuracy uh, information, right? So it ensures that uh, metadata is correct and up to date. Uh, it it uh, provides efficiency to the overall network and apps and indexes. So only contracts that have issued an updated uh, metadata notification they will be refreshed and instead of indexes trying to sync all the contexts and all the tokens every time periodically it's pretty flexible as we saw and it provides different modes of updates and um, it uh, it vastly improves user experience user can trust the information that they are seeing because it's already up to date information So in short, SIP 19 will provide a standard way to notify Stacks network when metadata is changed. And this helps to keep token information accurate and up-to-date, uh, improves user experience and efficiency. And that was about it. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, anybody got any questions, please feel free. And then I see uh, Raphael in the audience who is a SIP author. Each SIP has an author, has one or more authors, and these are all the contributors 
uh, who built the fundamental infrastructure or standards for the SACS network. So big shout out to Raphael. Um, yeah, if anybody got any question, please raise your hand or unmute. Hey, Hero. Um, yeah, I, I have a few comments. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much. Well, hold on, let me turn on my camera. You should be able to see me. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much to J2P2. That was a fantastic summary of SIP19. Um, I actually been I've been thinking from some conversations that I've had with um, different people on the ecosystem. Actually, uh, Igor and myself have been talking briefly about this um, a couple of days ago. I think we'll need to tweak this uh, SIP a little bit to include some cases that um, were not um, known at the time when I wrote the SIP. And one of those cases will, will be very helpful for SBTC because um, as we know, SBTC has a variable supply, which means that the supply of the fungible token changes depending on how much Bitcoin is locked into the stacks network from from bitcoin layer one um and right now the option that best fits this scenario is that sbtc should have a notification with a dynamic update as j2p2 just explained but the dynamic dynamic updates only uh, allow you to specify an interval in seconds and it would be better if the, this interval would could also be specified in blocks. So uh, what this would mean would be that whenever there's a new burn block or Bitcoin block, um, the metadata for this specific token, SBTC, should be updated to reflect the new supply, right? So every time there's a new Bitcoin block, uh, the supply would possibly change. For example, if um, anybody logs in some Bitcoin or logs out or you know pegs out Bitcoin into layer one, uh, and we should reflect that supply change as soon as we can. So maybe uh, um, an amend to the SIP would be to add this option to specify like how many burn blocks do you want the metadata to be refreshed, right? Um, so that's one. And the other is um, there have also been some new NFT collections on Stacks that have a variable uh, token number, which means, um, so when NFTs first started getting popular like a year ago and SIP19 was designed, collections were pretty much uh, static in, in, the, in the sense that they only had, let's say, uh, 2,500 uh, tokens or 10,000 or 5,000, you know, and that number never changed. But there are new types of collections that people have been uh, deploying into the Stacks network that have a variable number of tokens. So let's say that you have um, a collection of your artwork and you don't want to mint all of the items at once and you want to be releasing this series of artwork over time. So you create, let's say, one uh, digital image per week or whatever. So then you mint uh, the first token and then a couple of days later you mint another and then you mint another. And right now, SIP19 notifications only allow you to refresh tokens. They don't allow you to refresh contracts because there's really no concept of a contract metadata. But in this case, um, there's a need for some kind of notification that tells the network like, hey, this NFT contract uh, changed its total number of tokens. And at that point, the indexers can just refresh the last token ID and then get the, met the metadata for the new tokens that were detected, right? Um, so anyway, I, I just wanted to comment that. Um, uh, I might write an amend to the SIP. Actually, this is also a good question because I don't know if there's already a process that maps when a SIP needs, needs to be amended. 
I know that there's a process when a SIP needs to be replaced by a new SIP, but not necessarily when it needs to be just corrected or fixed. So it could be just as simple as sending a pull request, um, but not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Hero, on how we should proceed in these cases. Well, I'm definitely not <laughs> smart enough to answer that. Uh, and we don't have that president, like you said. I think it would be up to, you know, people like yourself and Jesse, maybe, or each uh, representative of each uh, committee to maybe come together on what is a consensus on how to go about doing such amends to tax. Uh, maybe, I, I don't know whether we need to keep the previous records, so my initial thought would be maybe you have SIP 19 and then you have dash. I, I don't actually know, like dash one or what. Um, but maybe Jude, when Jude is back, that I think Jude might be a great person to ask that question to. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, at the very least, we could have like a, sort of like an edits section in the in the SIP document and like an uh, change log inside of the doc. I mean, that could work. What, what I'll do is I'll just send a pull request to the SIP 19 markdown document, and then maybe we can discuss there. And that could even be like a meta uh, SIP sort of thing that establishes some precedent for these kinds of cases um, that are really not obviously not consensus critical. It's just like a standard, right? And standards may change. So I don't know, maybe it makes better sense to write like a, a new SIP that only adds to SIP 19 or change SIP 19 and reflect that change in the document. I mean, we can discuss there. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm in favor of adding a new SIP if a previous SIP has already been ratified. Um, I don't think we should be changing them after the fact. Okay. Do do you think this new SIP should uh, replace SIP 19, like be a superset of, of SIP 19, or just add the extra stuff? Um, uh, it, it depends, honestly. Like either one could absolutely work. Uh, what you're describing, I think, could be you know an add on to SIP 19. So as part of the SIP text, it just says, hey, this builds on SIP 19. It's going to change these things or add these new features. Um, and then if it happens, the process continues for that new SIP. Um, just building on what 19 already uh, had approved. Yeah, it makes sense. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, the reason I think that too is just because you know the SIP process is not um, you know simple. There's voting involved. People have to evaluate it. Um, changing it after the fact, I think, would be a bad precedent. Good point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I'll just open a, a, a PR for, let's say, a new SIP, and then we can figure it out from there. If it sure. uh, includes the whole text of SIP 19 plus the new stuff and replaces SIP 19, or if it's just like adding the extra notification types, for example, and just say this is like uh, a supplement to SIP 19, right? Yeah, I would say uh, I would be in favor of just like a diff, essentially. Um, so you're not just copying and pasting SIP 19. You're just saying, hey, here's the you know the reference I'm using, SIP 19, link to the, the current SIP. Um, and then say, this is what is going to be changed or added to it. Um, I think that would be sufficient. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, because I, um, I mean, I just realized that obviously SIP 19 contents will not be up for discussion at that time, only the new stuff. So it wouldn't make right. sense to include in the new text, everything that was mm -hmm. before, right? Yep. Yeah. It's actually just a diff. Cool. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. I'll, I'll do that. Sounds great. Um, Philip. Yes, Andres, go ahead. Oh. Hi. Hi, friends. Uh, nice to see you again, or at least hear you. Um, uh, thank you very much for that proposal that I think that is very, uh, well, no proposal, uh, ratification of SIP 19 that uh, it looks very useful. My question is about um, uh, that uh, that will help the, the new, the new, 
tokens or the new metadata of the tokens or, or, or could be done for the previous one that was been already uh, issued, you know, and because that, and how do you implement that? Uh, um, uh, how do you how do you do it? Because maybe on the on the on the client side you have to have something like that, or uh, or the or the smart and, and the contract uh, side. So that would be useful to know. So then, uh, because we are, we are deploying several things, and then I, I want to make sure that uh, we have something updated. Uh, yeah, I, I can take that one. Um... So SIP19 defines only the standard for the notification. It is the uh, responsibility of the contract or the entities that are updating the metadata to emit the notification. It doesn't have to be emitted by the same contract that deployed the token. You can emit it from a different one. There are some rules around that that you can see on the SIP. Um, and I'll give you an example on how we use it. Uh, at Hero, we have uh, an API that gives token metadata information. So you can say, uh, you can query this API for data about like a fungible token, an NFT or an SFT, whatever you need. And it will give you the metadata as updated as it can. So this API, what it does is it listens for changes in the chain. So whenever it detects a new notification that uh, conforms to the standard set by SIP19, it will then refresh the tokens that were affected by the notification, right? So as soon as you send your notification, so let's say that you have a token, you change its metadata, then you send the notification, the, the API will receive it and then will refresh the notification, sorry, the metadata, and it will reflect the new one on, on the endpoint. So that's that's how this API works, um, but you can do pretty much the same if you're building an app. You can uh, listen for new blocks that are produced on the Stacks chain and inspect the transactions. And whenever you detect a transaction contains a notification like this, you can apply the change to the metadata as you need. Cool. All good, Philip. Yeah, he gave a Thank thumbs you. up. Thank you. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. All right. Uh, thank you, Rafael, for contributing to the SIP community. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. So let me continue to share the screen. So, yeah. So, apart from the ratified SIP, SIP nighting this month, we have the SIP 21, the Nakamoto stuff in progress. Uh, there are separate work streams that you can get updated on that specific stuff. So I'll refer you to Eagles events on Stacks calendar. And uh, one key stuff that is in, the, in discussion is the Bitcoin MEV, um, which looks like might be part of uh, Nakamoto early upgrade. Um, but yeah, I, next, Friday, the plan is for uh, all the proposals to come together um, and hopefully by the end of the day, uh, we should have a path forward on exactly what to do next and the you know, rough idea of the roadmap to get there um, so that we can resolve the Bitcoin MEV issue. Because I'm seeing community members are complaining um, about their yield. Actually, people don't know exactly what yield they're getting even. Uh, it's very unclear right now, um, but they know it's not as high as before. So just want to make sure uh, people is aware of the community sentiment right now. Um, but yeah, that's uh, hopefully will get solved pretty soon. And just a bit of update on the SIP editors front or other SIP efforts. So SIP editors being actually facilitating uh, the newcomers uh, on the multisig stuff. So a crossfire has connected um, uh, Vlad, who proposed um, the multisig wallet SIP, but he cannot just incorporate all the 
stuff he requires some blockchain update but he's managed to find other ways around which he's developing and directly connecting with hero and xverse and the zip editor sort of helped him because he was new to this community um so just want to highlight that the the zip editors served um a value in the community that they can help um these guys who want to propose new zip to get the right people um to help them develop the step and make that as frictionless as possible and and we uh, sub editors have published two official commentary um about sit 22 to 24 and um i think it was bitcoin mev sip um just sort of the impact that he has by using the right score and and what the status is on those stuff. So they are on GitHub and they're also on Twitter threads. Um, and in the future, they will be part of educating the people about the solution on the Bitcoin MEV issue and other stuff like SBDC newsletter. Uh, so yeah, feel free to uh, catch up on that separately. So yeah, I'm just gonna leave the floor very quickly for five minutes uh, in, in case anybody got any comments before we move to the um set pato presentation if anybody got anything they want to raise this is your chance uh well yes uh you know hello i'm we have uh i have two two suggestions for sips i don't know if the, it's it's for sips or not but uh, i don't know when when i can uh, i know your channels that you explained but um um which is the best way to to share with that? Uh, but essentially, is uh, based on inscriptions. You know, when do you do that in uh, you know talking and and then uh, maybe writing? But writing takes time. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, if I just go back to my slides, like one of the first steps um, is to post post them on Stacks Forum. But SIPCO is a place where you can also, this is exactly what the SIPCO is for. Like you can come and speak about it, like whether it's super early ideas and we have other people here can help you bounce that idea around and maybe shape it together. And this is the, the actual, one of the purpose of the SIPCOs. Uh, today's happened to be more steering committee, but uh, we're a little bit thin or a steering committee member. They, they, some of them cannot attend because family, uh, stuff they got to do but um but yeah I think I mean do you want to talk about your idea very briefly uh, because yes, we've got yeah I can for... just share ideas you know that um, one of the essentially one of the issues that uh, you see in in the market you know, is that uh, different institutions you know they have to share some some documents and and that um can be used by other applications you know generally they offer that for the general public because you know they they said okay i this person passed away and then they have a certificate of death certificate but then they're not shareable with, between different applications so what what are what we are what uh, we are proposing uh, is that uh, a way that uh, application can talk with each other uh, through um a SIP process that uh, will define the interfaces that uh, will will you know retrieve the information. So then, uh, so in, in, in this case, we are talking about inscriptions as, as the ordinals inscriptions and and NFT inscriptions. You know, the word inscription has been is has been used widely, and so then maybe we can establish a, a standard uh, that um, so then uh, inscriptions. You know, define a document that it will be. Uh, define as an inscription so they can you have different interfaces or different ways of interacting but uh, publicly so then if you refer a document or a certificate you can use this uh, zip process and then the other one is uh, for um, linking your national id or id document for example your passport and all that for for the the case of uh, associated with um with a um, a, a, a domain name or a subdomain name like philip.execator.app will have a, a linked uh, a national ID. And that's what we are doing, but we, we think that it can be done 
through uh, another inscription of national IDs, you know, something like that. So then, then any place in the world that can, okay, it can refer, oh, this uh, um, domain name or subdomain name has a, a national ID attribution or a link. So then, then that's something that has, it's kind of a, the same thing as a reputation, but uh, that uh, Trajan has, but in the sense of national. So that part also could be uh, turning, uh, turned up as a, as, um, as an inscription, but a, a, a more specific inscription re related to uh, the documents. That's all. Um, yeah, thanks for those ideas. I don't know if anybody else got any thoughts quickly. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, can we book a session with you and have your ideas discussed uh, more properly, officially as a topic of the week, of that week? Would that be okay for you? Uh, if there's any brief comment you can already make, I think it will be very valuable for you to post those brief bullet points on Stacks Forum. So maybe you have other, you know, people who are fairly knowledgeable in the Stacks ecosystem uh, commented even before our session, um, just to get the juice flowing. Um, welcome, so yeah, welcome. that's my recommendation for now. So yeah, if I may move on to set Pato. Sorry, was there a... Was that still a Q&A? Just for I just oh, one question. Yeah, it was. But uh, I don't think we have much time left. And I want to get to set Pato. Is there any quick comments you want to make? Yeah, it's a very quick comment. Um, I'm David, the developer of Stack Screener. I was just wondering if I remember seeing a grant proposal for stacks.py. And I was wondering if it is live. And if it is live, if anyone can find me a link to it or documentation for it. Or just point me in a direction where I can find out where it will go live. Thank you very much. um the ground ap application is that so maybe you can let me i'll link it in um it was like a it was a python um implementation of stacks.js oh me... pi is in py yeah, yeah py, PY. I, mean, <laughs> I was like oh uh yeah i can put a link to that here uh rohit is working on it and actually said pato uh can speak to that he's been working with rohit uh, uh some of the, the questions around the library. So it's it is it's an active development. It's not it's not done yet. I guess is my that was my question. Yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah, it, I believe it's downstream of the stacks rust, and um, so they're they're working together on those two libraries right now. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is there a link? Is it just the uh, the the grant proposal where the updates are? Yeah, py. Um, or is there anywhere else where like there's more public updates or could, should I just reach out to the developers of it if I want to kind of be more keen on what's going on there? Yeah. Um, do you want to drop your Discord uh, username in the chat and I will connect For you? sure. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Um, sorry, Sepato. <laughs> uh, overrun a little bit. Do you want to share your screen or how do you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, I will share my screen in just uh, a minute. I just want to uh, do like a brief intro and, and then I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, but so first of all, thank you, Hero, for having me on this call. And not many of you know me, but my name is Pato Gomez, also known as Seth Pato. I have been part of Strata Labs for the past two years as a Clarity engineer, alongside with Seth Byrne and Seth Sus. And over the past few months, I've been working in the Stacks Critical Bounties program. So what I'm doing here today is to present the grant 874, which is the SBTC bridge plugin for Electrum. So the idea of this grant is to create an, a plugin to enhance the Electrum user experience when using the SBTC bridge. So for those who don't know Electrum, it's simply just one of the most widely adopted wallets in the BTC community. So why did we build this? Uh, so that the SBTC can have a much wider adoption across the BTC community. So 
with that introduction, let's get down to the to the demo. Uh, as in all demos, there are some things that work and some things that don't. So I will walk you through first the, the things that don't still work. And the first one is generating the pay to tabroot address because of a missing dependency on the Python library, which is currently being worked on. Also the withdraw function is also missing dependencies to be able to sign a message within Electrum with our stack's private key. And also the reclaim function for withdraw and deposit also is missing the dependency to be able to sign a message with, with our stack's private key within Electrum Wallet. So all that is being, is being currently worked on. So hopefully we will have an update soon. So let's get to the part that does actually work. So we can track SBTC pegging transactions. We can deposit send uh, slash send BTC to an address. We can track SBTC peg out transactions and we can track balances for stacks and SBTC of any given address, right? So right now what you are going to see is a live walkthrough of the Electrum Wallet plugin user experience. So now I will show my, I will share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. We see yeah. um, um, a command line. Yeah, terminal, right? Okay, so first of all, uh, what you need to do before you start using the Electrum is, of course, download the Electrum repo. And then you can also, well, clone your elect the Electrum repo, and then you can clone my Electrum repo, which has the, the plugin, right? So after you've done that and you've installed all the dependencies, you can uh, run this command, Python 3, run Electrum. Make sure you run it on testnet so that we're not actually using any real Bitcoin. So we will launch it on testnet, right? So this will prompt us to, if you haven't, you will be prompted to create a, a wallet where you will get your, your private key, your seed phrase, and, and you can set up a, a password. So right now I'm going to type my password. And uh, it opened in another window. Give me one second. So here it is. Here is the Electrum wallet, right? So right now you cannot see the, the SBTC plugin because you have to go to tools, plugins, and you will see the SBTC plugin. If you click on the question mark, you will see a brief description of what it is. It's a peg in and peg out SBTC, right? So we activate the plugin, we close our wallet so that it can refresh. And when we start it up again, it will load the Electrum plugin. As you can see, now that we have activated the plugin, the backend already starts doing things like fetching my wallet address within Electrum that has the most BTC, the biggest BTC balance so that it will use that one to send the next BTC. And as you can see, we have the SBTC plugin here. We have, I have created, uh, I try to make this as simple as possible. I had a tab for deposits, a tab for withdrawals, and a tab for summary, right? So in the deposit tab, you get two sub tabs where you will be able to deposit BTC and you will be able to track the transaction history of all the pegging transactions, right? So first of all, let's, let's go through the uh, BTC deposit. You will be able to input the, you are able to input the amount. You have to pass on your stacks address to be uh, tied to this Bitcoin account or this Bitcoin address. It automatically fetches the, the Bitcoin wallet that has a, the biggest amount. And after that, the SBTC wallet is automatically fetched from the API. The recipient address will be automatically generated with the pay to tap root uh, address. And it will automatically fetch the current transactions fees. Is it low, medium, or high, right? So after you just input this, you will be able to generate the script. And 
it fetches all the information, it fetches the transaction fee, and then you just have to click deposit BTC. It, you can see in the terminal all the things happening in the back end, and you will sign your transaction here. Okay. And transaction success. Uh, you can check the history to view your transactions from within Electrum, or you can use uh, the viewer inside the, the plugin. So if I go right now to history, you can see that here is the transaction that is being sent, right? So after that, what the user would, would want to do is to track their transactions, right? So here we can add any stacks address we want to track transactions for. So in this case, I want to track my address, of course, and I will input the address and it will give me back the ID of the transaction, the originator of the transaction, which was the SDX address, the BTC address it was sent from, the amount of in Satoshi's, to what script it was sent to, the pay to tabroot address, what type of transaction was this? It was a deposit, and the status committed. This in the in after 144 blocks, it might change to rebuild or to reclaim or or whatever uh, uh, happened in those 144 blocks, right? Then uh, when we go to withdraw, it's the same uh, process. We only input the amount we want to withdraw. We input our STX address. We have the, the BTC wallet that will be assigned for this transaction. We click withdraw BTC. We sign the transaction and it will give us a, a message that, that it was successful, okay? So after that, we would want to do exactly the same, right? We would want to track our peg out transactions where we will copy our address, paste it, and it will give us, again, the ID, originator, the BDC address, the amount, the type, and the status that is currently in. Of course, this will be updated. If in the case we get a, a status reclaim, we will be able to reclaim the SBTC here. And uh, in this case, we would need to enter the ID of the transaction. So it fetches all the information from that transaction and is able to, to, to fetch all the, the information. After prompting the, the user to enter the ID, then we will prompt the user to enter the password so that we will be able to sign that transaction. Okay. So last and not least, the, the summary is just a way of tracking uh, the balances of, of our stacks and our SBTC that uh, Stacks Wallet currently has, right? So in this case, I grabbed one of the addresses that, that the team has been using to, to test. And I will paste it here to make sure that it actually has some SBTC and some STX. So I will add it. And as you can see, you, we, can, we can see that the STX balance they have is 506 and the SBTC balance they have is this amount, right? So you can see also in the backend, all that is happening within the, the, the plugin, right? So that's practically the, um, the user experience uh, that is being implemented in the, in the plugin. And, um, if you have any feedback, please let me know. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, where can you learn more about, about this? Where can you uh, have more information about what's going on here? Well, for starters, you have to follow this tax critical bounties program where not only this is, is happening, a lot of other things are, are going on in the, in the background. And also you can follow my uh, GitHub repo uh, I can link it right now in the in the chat so that you can follow it. Um, and of course, in the README file, you have all the instructions to download Electrum, how to set it up, and then how to set up uh, my GitHub repo so that you can use this this plugin. 
And uh, before I finish, also I want to give a shout out to the whole Critical Bounties team and especially Will, who is in this call, for the coordination and the integration of the Critical Bounties grant program, which is of course not an easy task, but he has done so well and none of these would be possible without him. And from personal experience, I started in the Critical Bounties knowing only Seth Seuss and Seth Byrne, and now I have been collaborating with different developers across different work streams. So it has made the, the experience um, really great. So that's it for me. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Feel free to unmute um, if you want to ask any question. Just a big compliment. Great work, Pato. Uh, yeah, I mean, you really just showed up like day one, the first uh, critical bounty call that we had, and we're already showing a proof of concept and, you know, just dove in features. Uh, kudos to you. And yeah, just I think the whole process coming together with all of these critical bounties around SPTC. Uh, you know, helped in big part by Igor and just, uh, you know, there's been a lot of really, really fun collaborative teamwork uh, to see happen. And it's been super gratifying. And yeah, I can't wait to see all the products come to come to life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Will. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed my, my time working with the Critical Bounties. And say something. Yeah, uh, that was a pretty amazing demo. Uh, I think uh, other folks in your team, Sepato, have made a little loom and posted on Twitter. I think that might help here as well. Uh, that that looks pretty close to what I mind. So it's amazing to see it being become a reality. Uh, I I I like the idea of putting kind of a DC closer to where uh, Bitcoin you know folks uh, live, which is you know Electrum. Uh, I was curious about the back end. Are you actually sending transactions to uh, the network? Because our back end um, alpha is still a little bit broken. So I'm just curious how, yeah. what support you need yeah. to get that done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the sending BTC. Yes, I am. I am executing that transaction in the network. Okay. So so yeah, that that was definitely one of the toughest part to to figure out about Electrum how to internally create those transactions and sign them and execute them to the um, to the to the network. But, but yeah, uh, that is actually happening. All the other things uh, that happen is are, that are happening is through API calls. And and when I withdraw here, it was only like mock data uh, of how it, it will actually look because right now we can't withdraw, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. That, that was more to it uh, so that you can experience the the user flow that that it will have uh, once it's it's completely finished. Yeah, um, I think that the, the grants are maturing quicker than we can ship the infra. So yeah. uh, it's uh, I know. Uh, uh, it's great that uh, yeah that you guys are moving fast. Uh, I would say that uh, you've in one way or another built Python code that could be extracted right as a kind of stacks as BTC Pi library. So that could be something that you can work off of your project and then ship it separately and always could make it better. Because I know that there's something perhaps having a, a Python library could attract other kind of developers that may work more closely with Python rather than JavaScript. I think that would be a net plus. Yeah, yeah, I agree, especially because once we have this, I think it, it opens the door to, for projects in general in the Stacks community to start implementing a plugin or Electrum plugins for Electrum to have their apps or their uh, functionalities inside Electrum so that you know, it adds to the value of of having the Electrum wallet, right? And, and being able to use the SBTC from within Electrum. Uh, because right now we can peg in and peg out, but if we have a library uh, that will push developers in our ecosystem to, to push harder and, and try to also develop it for Electrum, right? So, so that way uh, it expands in, in a great manner.
Can I ask a, a few questions, sort of maybe not so technical questions, uh, because I'm not very technical. Uh, it's probably more of a business questions. If I share my screen, I just wrote a few questions down. Um, why is integration to electron community important? And how big is is the market? Like, do we know roughly? Or are they for retail or institutional guys? Uh, any call for action? Call to action. Uh, yeah, I believe I answered some of those questions. What is Electrum? Is practically the one yeah. of the most widely adopted Wallet. BTC Come wallets uh, in the BTC <laughs> community, uh, especially because of its security and it's mainly focused on advanced users, right? So yeah. why is it? important in integrating it to the Electron community, because since it is one of the most widely adopted uh, wallets, we would be getting access to, to all of those users for them to get to know SBTC and start using it, right? So that will, will help us. And uh, I honestly don't know how big the Electron community is. Uh, I think that is not as easy to, to find out as, as we would assume. And yeah, they're mainly just um, regular users, advanced users, as I mentioned, and any call to action. No, not yet. We haven't uh, developed any, any call to action uh, campaigns or strategies uh, yet. Uh, I assume because we want to, to have the product finished first before. And also one thing that, that might be challenging is that we have to submit the, the plugin to be um, reviewed by the Electrum team and they have to accept the integration and and yeah, it unfortunately is not on all our side. Uh, we may have a, a finished product, but if in the end, if the Electrum team doesn't want to 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 merge it with their with the repo, then we are blocked right there. But uh, but yeah, that's the, the current status. Cool. Thanks for those um, comments. Um, and one other question I had just for myself, like what if the transaction get uh, fees too low and it gets stuck? Because I'm seeing a lot of that recently. Um, and because it's harder to RBF the transaction. So is there any way that you look to prevent that from, well, having yeah. in lower probability of that happening? Yeah, uh, well, the, the plugin actually fetches the fee information from the SBTC Bridge uh, API. So it's getting the most up-to-date fees that you, can, that you can use. And it also gives you the option to select if you want a low fee, a medium fee, or a high fee, right? So uh, if you want to avoid any hiccups with that, I suggest you use the, the high fee. That probably will will make it that uh, that doesn't happen. Oh. Yeah. Anybody else got any comments? I think I see, I see Brad saying it's great for V1. And he says Exodus is also very trusted. Um, oh, but <laughs> anyways. Electrum. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. If anybody got any other question, if not, I will just close it out. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I do want to remind everybody that hopefully, pre, um, that next Friday we'll have all the MEV stuff um present presented, and I know Aaron's got a, a very good, uh, well thought out solution as well. So hopefully um, we can all come together and and have a way forward to solve the Bitcoin MEV issue. Um, please tune in next Friday. Um, but yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Pato. Yeah, thank you, Hiro. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye.